Laura Lipton's new novel uh, has been earning the kind of reviews you've come to expect from such a prolific and expert writer. Um, they're starred and enthusiastic. <laughs> but uh, for me, Lipton represents Baltimore in a way us natives can be proud of. Um, she captures the closeness of community and its oddness sometimes. Um, the novel she presents tonight is full of the unexpected, however. Um, what lies beneath the surface, complex motivations, dark secrets, stalk the characters of After I'm Gone, presenting the page-turning question of can we ever really know anyone? Beginning rather sweetly at a dance, middling in the decimation of a marriage and the character of a spouse, and finally revealing, or perhaps not revealing, the secret so many attempt to take to the grave, Littman's novel gives us a story after story of truth, survival and strength in the lives of so many dynamic women left behind. Please join me in welcoming Laura Lippmann. I scared her by hugging her. Something I learned to do from my Jewish in-laws. Uh, thank you for coming out tonight. Uh, I'm gonna talk and then take questions. And what I'm gonna talk about tonight is that Big conversation I'm going to have to have with my daughter pretty soon, a lot sooner than I thought I was going to have to have. She's going to want to know, and pretty soon I'm going to sit her down and tell her where ideas come from. The fact of the matter is, is a lot of people who um, think they know writers really well, and they do. Um, I'm thinking about people I've met who are fans of the mystery genre who go to conventions and conferences, because you could do that every month of the calendar year for mystery fiction. And it's one of the best things about being a mystery writer is this dedicated group of fans who considered a vacation to go to some place like Albany, New York and sit around and talk to mystery writers. <laughs> and they will tell people, they will tell the, the newbies in the crowd, oh, whatever you do, do not ask a writer where he or she gets his ideas. I've heard this a lot. And I have heard, to be fair, I have heard writers complain about this question. I have always been puzzled by this. It seems to me to be a fair question and a reasonable question and possibly an interesting question. And I've never quite understood why there are writers who don't want to answer it because for me it's been to some extent different for every book. And with this book in particular and in this venue in particular, it's important for me to talk about where the book After I'm Gone came from. Uh, one of the things that I've decided to really make a fine point of as I'm traveling and talking about this book is my books are not, not based on real life stories. And I know some people in the audience are like, well, wait a minute. What about what the dead know? That was clearly based on the Lion Sisters. What about this book, if you know anything about Baltimore? It's clearly based on Julia Salisbury, the Baltimore number runner who disappeared in 1972. No, not based on, inspired by. The thing that I do that's very different from law and order, ripped from the headline stuff, is that I generally write about stories that most of my readers have never heard about. In the world at large, very few people knew the story of the Lion Sisters, whom I wrote about in 2007. Here we did, people who were here at the time, yes, absolutely. And that was something that kept me in check. Yes, in Baltimore, people of a certain age know about Julius Salisbury, although I would venture to say that people under 50 don't know about him. But at any rate, that's a really important distinction to me because when you talk about a novel or a film that is based on something, part of the currency that work is dealing with is that people come to it knowing a lot of the story. That's not what I'm doing. I find situations in real life that interest me and I write about those situations. And because ideas are very personal and because I have to spend a year with my idea, I don't let other people give me ideas, ever. Now the most common thing that happens is someone comes to you and says, I have an idea to be fair about this, I'll tell you the idea, you write it, and we'll split things 50-50. <laughs> now this happens to every writer I know. And it's really interesting if you think about it because it presumes that the idea is everything. 
and that the writing of it is pretty mechanical. I'm just a human typewriter. All I need is my idea, and d -d 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 there it comes out, like you know, some old Univac system. Uh, I gracefully decline all these offers. My favorite one was once when I was on book tour, and I was in Phoenix, Scottsdale. It's pretty far flung, and I was traveling, so I had someone driving me around. He was a very nice man. He was a very nice man. He was perhaps not the most gifted storyteller I had ever met in my life. And he told me a lot of stories about growing up on a farm in North Dakota. And these stories went on like all afternoon and into the night. And finally, the sun is setting late over the mountains of Scottsdale. And he says, you know, a lot of people think my stories should be in a book. What do you think about that? And I said, well, why does Arizona not have daylight savings? Because <laughs> you can't really win with that conversation. I mean, I have respect. Everyone's stories matter. And I actually think that anyone who wants to write should. I don't think everyone should necessarily publish. That's a different topic. But I really do believe in writing as a form of self-expression. And I would never discourage anyone who wants to do do it from doing it, but I don't want to do it for them. I want to work with my ideas. And the fact is, is more often than not these days, because I have written 19 books and people do read them, more and more people really get what I do. And they totally understand it. And they come to me and they have figured it out. They even get that distinction between being inspired by and a real life event and basing on something on a real life event. And people will come to me and say, what about this? What about that? And it's a good idea, but it's, it's generally not for me, even though they've, they've got it. They, I mean, one of the things that you will see in my work is that most of it, I would say, if we go back to what the dead know, which was followed by well, there is a test book in there, but there's What the Dead Know, Life Sentences, I'd Know You Anywhere. All of those books are inspired by real life stories, although I defy anyone to ever figure out what Baltimore crime inspired I'd Know You Anywhere. It is designed so people cannot figure that out because it did involve a living person who was a victim of sexual assault. The one book where I made up everything was the book about the prostitute. This is absolutely, there is no woman out in a mysterious suburb between here and Baltimore who is using a lobbying firm as a cover for a high-end call girl ring. <laughs> and that was the one book where when I was touring, everyone was like, oh, I'd really like to know about your research. <laughs> uh, that was the question I got time and time again. So someone comes to me and they get what I do, and I feel kind of bad in that situation for saying, no, no, that's, that's not for me. Uh, the one time I didn't feel bad, well, it wasn't someone who came to me with an idea. I talked about writing the book, I'd Know You Anywhere. Um, that is a book where the genesis of the idea was developed in 10 minutes out of sheer pettiness and spite. Uh, the other thing about ideas, it's my job. My job is to have ideas and it's no big deal. I have never been someone who wants to set writing off behind these, you know, or set it up and above other people and suggest that it's some lofty pursuit. It's really storytelling, narrative is the universal human language. Most people can do it. They can't necessarily do it well, you know, witness the driver with the life in North Dakota, but still, he was telling stories, telling them, you know, in a form. Everybody does it. We do it as very small kids. So I'm never the person who's like, oh, this is some amazing ethereal pursuit that is not for mere mortals. My job is to have an idea every year. I don't have an idea for my next book. I'm totally not sweating it because one day I will sit down and actually experience has shown me I can typically have an idea pretty fast, but the day I had it the fastest was I was in Montgomery County. I was at a writer's event. And this is an event on a Saturday. It is people who want to write. And they need pragmatic advice. They have taken time away from their families. They're taking a Saturday out of their life 
to find out what it's going to take to help them get to the next step in a project. And there is a keynote speaker. Did I mention this is about me being petty and spiteful? Because that's really important to the story. Because the keynote speaker snubbed me. Came down the line of other writers at this event, shook everyone's hand, burbled over everybody, and then got to me and was like, uh, it, it had nothing to say. Barely even, ha and now the thing is, it's not that this person should have heard of me or known my work, except for one little thing. We were in the same anthology that had just been published like a month ago. You might think it would have, you know, you'd notice. Just, did you even look at the table of contents? We're in the same book together. Fine. So the writer got up to give a speech, and it was everything I hate about writing speeches. It was dreamy and airy-fairy, and it made writing sound so magical and so romance-infused. And the advice, I mean, people paid to be here. And they're being told, try to write close to your dreams. If you can, don't write too often in the same place. It will go stale. My father, who is a writer, used to move from the hammock to the chase. <laughs> and I was like, and I really, OK, I'd been snubbed. I'm petty. I'm spiteful. That's, I will never take that part out of the story, because it doesn't happen unless I'm a very small, nasty person. <laughs> but I really do disagree with this advice. I really don't think this is helpful to most people starting out. As a matter of fact, I thought it was the opposite of helpful. If I had been a young writer in that room, I would have run out screaming. You're lucky to have a place to write. I mean, I'm a professional writer. I spend a lot of time in this little tiny desk in my kitchen. I write in coffee shops. I go where I can find a spot. I write on airplanes. So I thought, well, you know, I, there's a part of me that would just like to stand up and denounce the speaker and march out in a huff, but that would be very unfair to the lovely people who have put on this event. So I'm going to have a private argument, and I'm going to win because this person doesn't even know we're arguing. <laughs> very best way to argue. And I am going to prove that everything this writer is saying is wrong by having the idea for my next novel before this writer finishes talking. Took out a piece of paper, took out a pen, good old fashioned brainstorming, circles. And the circles were just organized under, I find this interesting. There's a, I, don't rem I wish I had this piece of paper because I know one of the circles mentioned the novel Lolita, which, was, uh, my, it, which is my favorite novel. And another one, the key one was, Baltimore crimes that nobody remembers but me. <laughs> and I began thinking of one, and I did remember that there was a crime when I was young that involved a serial killer rapist who kidnapped his victims in more than one state, Maryland was one of those states, raped them, then killed them, and did this pretty consistently until the victim that this serial killer kidnapped in Baltimore. He raped this victim but he did not kill this victim. He kept this victim with him when he then went and kidnapped, raped, and killed another victim in front of this victim who was left alive. And for the first time, I'd known this story probably 25 years at the part I'm talking about, I thought, what's it like to be the person who lived? And that became a book I wrote and published in 2010 called I'd Know You Anywhere. So I just don't think having ideas is that big a deal. I'm fine getting them. I can get them fast. I have no shortage of them. I never go blank. Uh, you know, one of my novels, I just sat in a coffee shop and thought about Charles Dickens and then started thinking about Nightmare on Elm Street, and somehow that leads to me writing a book called The Most Dangerous Thing. I still don't understand it. But there is one person who kept coming to me with an idea, and this person had a unique advantage. I'm married to him. <laughs> and the advantage is not that he's very bright and has very good ideas, although that is true. The advantage is, is I can't get away from him. <laughs> so he kept coming back to this same idea. Julius Salisbury. Julius Salisbury. This is an interesting story. Now, now this is probably went on for five years. Julius Salisbury was a number runner in Baltimore. A number runner, actually, he ran an organization of number runners. 
He ran the big illegal street lottery in Baltimore in the 60s into the 70s. And at the same time, he was a very responsible, loving father, husband, suburban man, gave to his temple, also owned a burlesque house, was a devoted husband, also had a girlfriend who happened to be a stripper. And my husband, who does understand what I did, kept talking about these two women, the wife and the girlfriend, and there's a story. And he probably told me, of course, now we disagree about this. Now, inevitably, we don't have the same version of how this happened. He says that he also always mentioned the fact that in real life, Julia Salisbury had three daughters. I don't remember that really. I think he did actually. I think he's right about that. But it wasn't hitting my brain for whatever reason. I just kept hearing triangle, triangle, triangle. And I was like, eh, I don't, don't want to do a triangle because it's always a sad story. I mean, I just didn't, I didn't see what I had to say about that. But it, then at some point when he was making his case yet again, and he is not someone who gives up easily, the three daughters clicked. And suddenly I began to say that this could be a story about generations of women. The daughters in my story, and by the way, I couldn't even begin to tell you the birth dates of the real daughters of Julia Salisbury. That's how little research I did into his life. The daughters represent the baby boom and Generation X, which came, is it Generation X that came, comes next? I always get a little bit confused about that. The mother represents the generation that gave birth to the baby boom. She would have been born in 1940, which is a little bit younger than my mother, but not significantly younger. And then the girlfriend, although technically a baby boomer in some ways, is yet a different generation unto herself. She's an earlier baby boomer. And so now I have what I need because now I see that in addition to writing a crime novel, of course, the first thing I have to do is figure out, okay, who am I going to kill? <laughs> because in real life, there was no murder, uh, not among the family, not involving the family. There was nothing like that. But I write crime novels. This is what I do. But beyond that, I began to see that this was an opportunity to write a novel that was a murder mystery, most definitely. You're introduced to the murder in the second chapter as it's taken on by a cold case detective in the modern day but also a chance to write a history, a popular culture history of women literally in my lifetime because the two main characters in this novel meet 14 days after I'm born, February 14th, 1959. And the book continues up through 2012. And there I had it. I had my idea and I finally let someone give me an idea uh, I do think that going forward, only people married to me will ever be able to do this. But who knows how things might change. Uh, the book is dedicated to my husband because I was actually very grateful that he kept pressing his case until I finally began to see it. Although he would be the first to admit that the novel that resulted is nothing like anything he imagined it would be. And with that, I will take questions. Uh, I'm going to bring in the reality principle. I was in the back room of the Oasis the night that it was raided. <laughs> I was an assistant U.S. attorney at the time, and uh, that was the night we raided the Oasis, which is the, I, I forget what you call it in the book. Well, the way, I, I, think I book don't call terrific. it anything because the Oasis is not in my book. Again, <laughs> it's like, really? <laughs> These but, are not, this is not Julia Salisbury. It is not the Oasis. I, you know, if you notice, I know you probably haven't read the book. Have you read the book yet? Oh, yeah, I thought it was terrific. Uh, thank you so much. Do you notice the book is entirely vague about Felix's legal problems? It doesn't go into them at all. I mean, there is so much rumor and gossip about the legal case and why did he get 15? It's like I was so not going there. You know, I start when I when the book the book starts literally starts with the night he runs away, right. because in my view, that's when the story starts. And yeah, is it a little bit, I, I'm kind of surprised no one sort of hit me up on this yet. 
It's one thing to have a novel in which all of the sections about the family are wrapped around ritual and sort of milestone events, a baby shower, uh, a wedding, sitting Shiva, Friday night supper, a bat mitzvah. I, I kept thinking someone was going to say, uh, really, did you have to have July 4th, 1976? <laughs> the bicentennial as the night someone escapes. But it was really, I needed the 4th of July, and it just happened to fall on 1976. But well, there's one connection between something you wrote in here about the guy who took off, unnamed, uh, or Felix, and the reality. Oh, yeah. He, he said there is a connection between um, the real-life Julia Salisbury and my made-up Felix Brewer. It's probably you, by accident. Well, could be. But you have a uh, paragraph where you talk about that his wife is shocked that he uh, could read Hebrew and that he was sort of religious in his own way. He found some solace in going to temple and all that sort of thing. When we were searching the rather sordid back rooms of the Oasis nightclub, there was a tall, big Irishman who had brought, come down from Philadelphia who was leading the investigation, and he goes into, I'm standing there, and he goes into a metal closet, standalone, and he brings out a blue velvet bag, and he unzips it and kind of looks at it and is totally, no. No? To fill in, which is even more strange with the phylacteries. This is have some straps and boxes and stuff, and he's looking at it like, what is this? Uh, see, I just and isn't it strange that in the back room of the Oasis, there it was? And I thought it tied in with your sense that this character had some. I just made feeling. that up. I know. I but just made right. it up. <laughs> quote, it my right. quote my hero, Donald Westlake. I became a novelist so I can make stuff up. <laughs> so thank, thank you. you. That's pretty cool. I mean, I'd love to, you know, I, you know, I, there is a lot. Do you think, do you think that um, Julia Salisbury died in Israel? The rumor was that the real life person had gone to Israel, but we, no one really knows, right? No one knows. No one knows. Thank you. Uh, you've touched on all of this, but could you talk more about your process? How much do you write each day? What time uh, of day do you write? How much do you rewrite? Are adverbs your friend or adversary? <laughs> How much contemporaneous research do you do? Okay, so this is a process question. I write a book a year, and it requires me to be pretty disciplined because while I'm a very, very fast writer, I'm not a fast, good writer. So I can't get behind. I can't say, oh, when I'm a month out from deadline, I'll be able to do an enormous amount of work. I won't be. I try to write a minimum of a thousand words Monday through Friday, a minimum. If I do that, theoretically, I would have a first draft in about three to four months. But it's a little bit like running old-fashioned wind sprints and, or ladders, you know, where you go up so far and you run back and touch base and you go up a little farther. Because what I do is I write, first of all, I write enough, usually about 50 pages, and then it's like, okay, now I'm going to go back to the beginning so I can polish this and send it to my editor and agent and they know that I'm just not, you know, sitting around doing nothing. They like to see that. It's a little bit unnerving because no one sees what I do over a year. So then I like, so I have 50 pages and I go back and I polish and now I start again and now I'm running up again and now I'm going to go until I get stuck and I will get stuck. History has shown that I will get stuck. So usually when you get stuck, it's because something's wrong in those first hundred pages. So I go back and I come back again and I try to find out what's wrong. Uh, if I'm working in a novel that uses time in an unusual way that goes back and forth in time, I actually write it in sequential order. The Brewer family sections of most of them, I, I probably got through like 30 or 40 pages with going back and forth between the past and the present day. But in general, most of the Brewer family stuff, which is all in the past, was written before I got to the modern day investigation, uh, most of it. So I keep going up and back, up and back. At a certain point, when I've usually been working about six to seven months, I do this entirely crazy thing in which I go to the art store and I buy all these supplies and I make what I call a non-textual outline of my book in the hopes that my colors and my shapes are going to identify problems for me. And this is totally bizarre. No other writer in the world 
has admitted to doing it. I've started giving craft lectures on it. It's not catching on, but it's what I do. And actually, I mean, I the, these um these charts I make are really sometimes quite beautiful. The one for the the one for this book was very basic. It, this book has a very Com it's a very accessible shape and format for me. I could see it right away. For, it, for this book, it was just a matter of seeing that enough points of view were getting in. Was I doing right by all five women? And so in that way, I will have a book done in about nine to ten months. But it's, you know, in the chair every day, Monday through Friday, pretty much. I mean, sometimes I can't. Uh, and then I know that, and I, I'm really, I'm, I'm a demon about making my deadlines. To the point where with my current book, which I turned in on, actually turned it in on January 30th. I think I turned it in a week early. I, I was asking myself, am I just trying to meet my deadline out of some sort of misplaced principle? My editor says I can have more time. Am I shortchanging the book by not taking the extra time? But I got to the point where I was like, no, the book is ready. The book is ready to be read by my editor and my agent, knowing that there'll be more revisions and more revisions and I mean by the time I'm done I bet I've done six to seven versions of the book so and in a year yeah I'm, I'm it gets faster and faster I do get much faster when I have the copy but my early copy is just hideous yeah. yes sir uh, you've written several books with uh, Tess Monahan the character mm -hmm. the great reporter uh, I'm from Baltimore really identify with your books. Um, when you get your ideas, do you th try to think of something for Tess Monahan, or do you get your idea and then say Tess Monahan would work with that, that plot or something? The first time work? I did a book that wasn't a Tess Monahan book, it was because it was so clear that she wouldn't be the central character in the book. And then after that, I made it a custom, a practice to alternate the standalones with Tess Monahan books. And then I got so very clever and I gave Tess Monahan a kid. And I didn't have a clue how to write about her with a kid. And it, I just, I really couldn't figure it out because I felt that this is a little corner I've painted myself into, which is the books still have to be suspenseful. But now everything Tess does, readers are going to say, oh, she shouldn't do that. She's a mom. How dare she take that risk? So it took me a while to figure it out. Uh, the book I just finished is a Tess Monahan novel, and it will be published in 2015. She's back. Great. With that, her kid. that was my next question. Will she be back? She's Good. back with a Great. toddler Great. and child care issues. <laughs> lots and lots of child care issues. Yes, Hi. sir? Have, are you ever tempted to take a character and, that you've dealt with in a standalone and turn that character into a, a, a serialist that he would continue or she would continue in another uh, book, in another vein? I appear to have done that now with this book. One of the characters in this book shows up in the test book in a very permanent way. So, um, yeah, I wasn't a, it wasn't conscious. I didn't go into the book thinking that, but I really, I began to see it. It sort of seemed right at the end of this book to take this character and make him Tess's partner. And, and uh, I see where Car uh, Carla Stout makes a cameo in, in this book. <laughs> Car is yes. that, that's, that's the first time you're dealing with? <laughs> well, the first time I dealt with Tess's daughter, Carla Scout, is and I was really grateful to um, Otto Penzler at Mysterious Bookshop commissions these short stories yeah, that he publishes right, and reading. gives them yeah. gives them to good customers, and he does collectible editions. And he asked me to do one for his bibliophile series, which um, <laughs> ask only that you write a story about bibliophilia, and I. I wrote a story about a children's bookstore in New York, a fictional children's bookstore in New York, and Carla Scout figured very strongly in that story. And that was sort of helped me get to the point where I could write the novel. I, I began to see it. I began to see I, what I realized is that the thing that was holding me back was the kid. So it's like, go straight at it. Go straight at the topic of kids. Have Tess working on a case that involves a child and, and involves motherhood and have you know, sort of motherhood and parenting be a big part of the story. So uh, my favorite scene in the book I just finished writing is when um, Carla Scout throws a tantrum in Eddie's grocery store at 5 o'clock on a Friday afternoon, and it's literally like in front of a shelf of white wine, and Tess is sort of like, 
I, I know the books say I'm supposed to pick her up and leave, but I have not bought any wine yet. <laughs> and um, it, it, When you write serially, like with Tess Moynihan, is, is there a different mental process between writing serially and writing a standalone? Is there a different process between the... I think the big thing is that in the series, until I'm ready to really put a bow on it and say it's over, you have to see the, the series book is almost like a 100,000 word chapter in Tess Monaghan's life. I can't use her up. You know, I get to the end of a standalone, most of these characters are done. They don't want to hear from me again. They like, you know, they're, and, and they've, they're, you know, it wouldn't make sense for there to be other upheavals in their life to write about. Uh, someone asked me this question in reference to After I'm Gone. It's really hard for me to see any of these characters coming back other than the character Sandy who did come back. Mm -hmm. I mean, the Brewer women are done with me. And I mean, I'm not done with them. I enjoyed their company, but they, they don't want to be in my imagination again. So thank you. That's Hi, did you have any take on the recent events in the Lion case around here? Uh, the Lion case, um, as for those who don't know, there was a break. They've identified this man in prison that they're asking people if they have any knowledge, if they have anything that they can tell police that would link him to the day the, the two sisters disappeared. M my understanding is that they don't have anything definitive yet, but they have identified this person of interest. And I'm just very hopeful. I'm just very hopeful that one day the end of that story will be written in real life. It sounds like his sister simply said, oh, yeah, he was there. And they've gone with that. Did, was anybody else who read those articles? Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. How it's you remember after all these years. It's it it's just you just wish for you can't you just I don't even know if you can hope for justice for the family at this point, but you certainly wish for knowledge. I mean we I think we all hate the word closure at this point, but I, I would love it I would love that to be solved. I mean one of the things when I was inspired by the Lion sisters as opposed to wrote a book based on them, I knew right away that I would supply an ending because in some ways I, you never like to stand here as a novelist and say these are the ways my imagination is limited so to say I could not imagine is not quite right but writing a novel that had as in life the lack of an answer seemed hmm. to me to be beyond my ability to write a satisfying novel that didn't provide an answer and yet at the same time I realized that that means that the story I wrote probably doesn't have anywhere near as much pain or pathos as the real life story. Yes, ma'am. Do you know this is the first woman who's gotten up to ask a question? Anyone else notice that? Just can't help it. Um, I have so many, but I'll stick with one. Uh, given your original storytelling, even though it may be inspired by real life, it, with your background as a journalist and all the people that you've met, I'm sure, up till now. Can you s prevent, or do you even want to prevent your characters from looking like people you know, having traits that you know in people? How do you put that together? I think what I've come to figure out over the years of writing books is that people are forever thinking that they inspired people that they did not inspire. And I've sneaked some people into my narratives that the inspirations have never recognized. Thank so, I, you know, a part of doing this is you just have to, you just can't, this is going to sound weird. It's not that you don't care what people think. Of course I care what people think. I want people to read my books and to enjoy them. I really want that. But I can't worry about the way that people are going to say, oh, I'm sure that character is based on me. I mean, you know, I've had friends say that and I just say, well, I don't, I don't think so, but what do I know? I'm just the person who wrote the book. Uh, there's, you know, you have people who, the people who will say, well, I think it's exploitative of you to even be inspired by real life events. I don't agree. What can I do about that? But there are definitely people who feel that way. Uh, so I just have basically sworn off worrying about the things I can't control in terms of what happens when the book goes out into the world. You know, some people, one time, a really smart novelist read one of my books and 
believed that on the page there were plot lines and facts that did not exist. And she was talking to me about my book. And it was such a different book in her reading. It was a really smart person. And you know what? I didn't contradict her at all because in a way, the book does belong to the reader. And the book has, I want the book to have thousands, tens of thousands of lives when it leaves. I'm not the final authority. So I don't worry about, I, I just like, I can't, I can't control it. People are going to think that I based, people are going to, oh, that's so-and-so. And uh, like, no, it's not. But I don't care if you say that. You know, I don't, it's fine. Did you, do you have a follow-up? Follow up? How, how much of yourself is in your books? Well, what's interesting is I put myself into the characters where people are most likely not to look for me. Like, everybody thinks I'm Tess. And, you know, Tess and I certainly share a worldview, I would say. Um, I'm not shellfish allergic. And, <laughs> you know, I, I'm a li I have much better impulse control. But... We certainly agree on a lot of stuff, but we're, you know, she's not me. She could be my younger sister in some ways. If people were to look for me in the books, um, I won't even say, they won't find me because I tend to put bits of my personality, I, I, truly, into some of the most disturbed characters in my books. <laughs> I, I, in this book, for example, someone was asking me about that. And I said, you know, the funny thing is, is that I think that... Um, Bambi is my fa the Bambi Brewer is my favorite character in the book. She just she's nothing like me, but she pr proves to be very resilient, and very resourceful, and intelligent. And her middle daughter Rachel is clearly the nicest and most empathetic of the three daughters. I said, but you know what? I think I'm a little bit of the two daughters. I have a little bit of the bossy explainer personality, the oldest daughter, and there was a lot in that spoiled brat of a youngest daughter that I really could identify with and no well first of all she's drop dead gorgeous so no one's gonna <laughs> think that's me but um yeah I those were the characters when I went through I was like and, and actually there's there's a little bit of me in in Sandy Sanchez who's a very lonely widower of Cuban descent and yet there I am in there you know I can I can see where certain parts of my worldview leaked into his I will look for that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. So are we, are we done with questions then? Such a, it's okay to be. <laughs> I just want to make sure that everybody's happy. And thank you all for coming out tonight. I mean, it's a Friday night. And <laughs>